Hey everyone, and welcome to this week's installment of Bonafide Fridays. The segment where we sit down with community members and have them share what their organization is doing in our neighborhoods. Today I've joined Cynthia Turlo, best known as CC. Can I call you CC? Yeah, that's that's okay, cool. <laughs> Who is the founder and executive director of Terebinth Refuge, which opened its doors in April of 2018. Terebinth Refuge is a Christ-centered shelter and safe home that brings hope, healing services, and freedom to sexually exploited and trafficked women. Prior to Terebinth Refuge opening up its doors, CC had started a specific program for sex traffic and exploited teen girls through her work with the Minnesota State Harbor Law. It was soon after this that she recognized there was very little for adult women in the state and followed God's leading to open Terebinth Refuge in central Minnesota. CC, I really appreciate you sitting down and joining me. Thank you. Thank you, Connor, for the opportunity. But before we get specifically to Terebinth Refuge, it might make sense to first lay a little bit of groundwork. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a little bit more to what sex trafficking is and its prevalence? Okay. Um, I always like to tell people that, you know, sex trafficking and sexual exploitation, which I will explain the difference, mm -hmm. um, is a huge problem in our world today. And um, it's one of the leading, um, leading um, problems, I'm all of a sudden getting the word, but really um, that is making huge amount of money in our world, um, and it's ri it rivals um, guns and drug sales, and it's like it's it's like second now behind one of those, and so it's a worldwide problem, but in our country, United States, it's a huge problem too, and I always kind of pare it down in every state and in in cities in mm -hmm. our in our country and right here in this community that I'm in. Um, it's, it's huge. It's just a problem that is very prevalent and it's very lucrative and that is why it continues within the neighborhood. So, um, when people talk about sex trafficking and sexual exploitation, mm -hmm. sex trafficking is actually a form of sexual exploitation and how um, we frame that. Is sexual exploitation is usually two people. You have a victim mm -hmm. and a buyer. Mm -hmm. But that can look different ways and so um, you can have someone who is participating in survival sex, mm -hmm. meaning they're, this is how they're surviving. They're on the streets, like a youth that is a runaway, mm -hmm. um, might be um, approached. And it's really s sexual exploitation is selling any, is, um, anything of value mm -hmm. is being traded for a sexual act. So it could be a roof over my head, mm -hmm. it could be drugs, it could be um, food, mm -hmm. um, because I'm a runaway and I'm cold and this person said, they would let me stay at their place, couch hop, but I'm gonna have to do something for them. But that's, you know, so that's that's survival sex. Mm -hmm. uh, or a woman who is, how this how she can pay her rent. Because the landlord is saying, you know, okay, I won't charge you, but you're gonna have to do this for me. Yeah. So there's two people involved, and that mm -hmm. can also be strip club, mm -hmm. and that can also be pornography, mm -hmm. you know, or filming or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk about trafficking, there's three people. So you've got your victim, your buyer, and then your trafficker. Okay. Yeah. So and that person is making money off of the sale of another human being. And so mm -hmm. sexual exploitation is over, you know, trafficking is underneath because it's trafficking is sexual exploitation. Yeah. So that's how you would determine the difference. So the trafficking, you have three people. You have a trafficker, mm -hmm. a pimp, or, a, you know, someone who is controlling a victim. Yeah. I never heard it put that way before with the two people and, and the three people, that's really helpful to yeah. distinguish and, yeah. and narrow it down to the definition of that. Right. That's very helpful, thank you. Yeah. And I mean, that just goes to show like, you know, I, I have so much to learn in this realm. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of us do. What would you say are some misconceptions that some people have? Right. Um, I think one misconception is, is that this is a big city problem. And people still kind of think of when they think of prostitution, you know, is that street walker who's out and someone approaches them in a car. And that does happen. Okay. I know in Las Vegas it yeah, happens sure. quite a bit. Um, but that right now, the internet is really the huge way that trafficking and exploitation happens. Um, and so we don't necessarily always have the street walker. Um, so it's, I think, a big misconception is people think it's the big city problem. And the reality, it is everywhere. And it is in small communities and small towns, and it isn't just a big city problem. 
And so that's a misconception. I think another misconception is we used to always talk about the movie Pretty Woman mm. with, mm -hmm. um, what's her name? <laughs> I actually don't know if I've ever seen it, so I okay. don't know. If it's person. an older movie that really <laughs> okay. glamorized the life of a prostitute. Okay. And she ended up meeting this man, and then there was this romance, and he rescued her and stuff. And it, and it really glamorized it and made it look like this is a really legitimate business that she was doing, and it's okay, when in fact it's a very degrading and vile and violent life. And so that really didn't help for many years, and people, oh, you know, made it look like it was something that was maybe even worth attaining to. <laughs> and then um, another movie that I think about is Taken, Yes. And yeah, yes. although those scenarios can happen, mm -hmm. people often think that the main way that a young person or a person is taken, you know, has got into this is they are just grabbed off the street, thrown in the trunk of the car mm -hmm. or thrown in the car or whatever. That does happen, um, but that's not the main way that this is happening, mm -hmm. that people are groomed into this. Mm -hmm. And a trafficker will take their time. And when I talk about internet, um, it's pretty common for uh, traffickers the, at this day and age to sit behind the internet and peruse through all the chat rooms, Snapchat, Facebook, all the different places. I don't even know all of the different ones that young people are in, yeah. talking about themselves and their friends, and mm -hmm. they are looking for vulnerable young people. Mm -hmm. And when they can find someone who you know, feels like their, their home life is horrible, their parents don't care, or they're bullied at school, or they struggle with depression or anxiety, mm -hmm or on the, all numbers of vulnerabilities, yeah. that person is clever and very um, cunning mm -hmm. and is able to look and see who their friends are, maybe say, or what they like. Oh, you like this band, so do I. And, mm -hmm. you know, just build a, groom them into believing they can trust this person. And it could be a 38-year-old man and posing as an 18-year-old boy. Mm -hmm. And, oh, you're, you know, you're really cool, and I really like you, and, you know, send me a picture, oh, you're really pretty, and just slowly, slowly pulls this person in. Mm -hmm. And young people don't, are always, you know, they think they can handle themselves, and this is just a really nice guy that gets me, and I really like him, and I can really trust him, and they don't even know who that really is. And often what happens in those scenarios is they've built this shot, and they'll take their time, a couple months, three months, four months and they're grooming all kinds of girls at mm -hmm. the same time. And then at some point when, you know, oh, my parents really suck, you know, they made me, they're, you know, um, grounding me and I can't do anything. And then this person, well, you know, I can, you know, I can meet you at the McDonald's up the street or I can do this or I'll send you a, a cell phone so you can talk to me personal. And then your parents don't have to know. And then it just goes until at some point they meet them and then they're gone. And the parents have no clue what happened to their daughter. And that's a lot of times the majority. Of that scenarios. happens a lot. Okay. Or the picking up kids, homeless kids, kids who are couch hopping, kids who look like they're, you know, um, they get sucked in because they don't have many options or children. Or adult women who don't have any options because mm -hmm. they've been. And um, often, it's pretty common with the women we work with that a high percentage of them were sexual abuse victims as young as children, little children, and so that sets them up for a vulnerability right there um, where they are easily groomed or easily, their self-esteem, all those things are really a struggle and so they, and traffickers are skilled at sniffing all those things out. They can figure it out. They actually train each other. There's actually, at my understanding, there's books that you can buy on how to be a good trafficker. <laughs> so, so um, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty, um, Tricky, yeah. and and then there's the boyfriend pimp who you know finds that vulnerable gal on the street and just yeah. hey you know and showers her with gifts mm -hmm. and you know gets her dressed up and just gives her everything that she obviously needs because she obviously doesn't have a family that's caring for her yeah and becomes her either her boyfriend or her daddy mm -hmm. uh, and just rescues her in her mind it's like oh this guy really cares about me, he loves me, he's taking me out to eat in fancy places I've never been, he gives me um, name brand clothes, and, and then slowly, slowly they get them, and then it's like, okay, now you owe me, I'm, I'm, you know, you need to do this for me because you've, I've spent this much on you, and so then they suddenly can become violent and say, you have to do this, yeah. or you, you know. Yeah, a variety of, of yeah. 
is that women and girls, and I always talk women and girls because that's who I'm working with, but in this day and age, boys are being trafficked as well, and they're being groomed into the wrong thing. So that's, that's incredibly sad. Yeah, it is. It is yeah. really sad. And, um, and the thing that with kids is they're so unsuspecting and, yeah. so, and think that they they think they, you know, their brains aren't fully developed and they think they can, yeah. you know, oh, this is just, I can handle, you mm -hmm. know, this situation. I, you know, it's just a boy thing. But it's, like, it's weighty. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. You, you mentioned also that at one point you had realized that there's really very little out there for adult women in mm -hmm. Minnesota. Is, is this part of the, the inspiration behind Urban Refuge? Very much so. Okay. And that kind of starts with Safe Harbor and I can about that if yeah. you want. Yeah, okay. please. So um, Safe Harbor is a law that is supposed to be passed in every state in the nation. Mm -hmm. And many of the nations have passed a Safe Harbor law. And basically the law says that any youth that is found being sexually exploited or trafficked is deserving of services versus being treated like a criminal. So what we don't want to do is you find this um, girl and throw her in juvie because she's a bad little girl. Well, we understand now that she's not a bad little girl, but she was groomed in and she was manipulated and, you know, brought in. And so we want to treat her in a way that she can get help, mm -hmm. get services versus being treated like you need to be locked up for a little while. Absolutely. Um, and so in Minnesota, we passed our safe harbor law in 2011. Mm -hmm. And what was really great about Minnesota is we had legislatures and a group of us who were part of the Minnesota Human Trafficking Task Force, the statewide task force, yeah. worked to encourage getting that law passed. But then the legislature, um, having seen the work and our presenting what was needed, mm -hmm. um, gave monies and opportunity for these large working groups to start to develop a system of care in mm -hmm. Minnesota. And um, so what's different about Minnesota and really has been one of the leaders in our country, there's other states that have done some of this work, is that we develop a system of care mm -hmm. for youth, whereas some states pass a law and then they did nothing with it. Okay. So even their law enforcement doesn't really understand the law and they still might pick up a kid and throw her in juvie. Okay. Um, whereas in Minnesota, along with that law saying youth should get services, we also, part of it was, at the time, was that officers would be educated yeah. and that we would have stiffer penalties for buyers and traffickers. So mm -hmm. those are the three pieces. Absolutely. And so what we did was a group of people worked really hard in all walks of life, professionals, all kinds of professionals mm -hmm. and survivors, um, to develop the Safe Harbor, no wrong, the Minnesota Safe Harbor No Wrong Door model. Mm -hmm. And that basically, in the no wrong door model, is saying that you know it doesn't matter where a child is found, a youth is found, whether it's in school or in a hotel sting mm -hmm. or wherever, that they're deserving of services. Yeah. And so with that model, the legislature passed, said yes, this is good, and they gave us pots of money to start the system. Oh, man. And so currently, in that, and so in 2014. Um, money was given to the organization I was working at called the Heartland Girls Ranch mm -hmm. because I had plans to start the Hearts for Freedom program yeah. for teen girls who were being exploited mm -hmm. and three other organizations in the state mm -hmm. and that was their starting point yeah. and so we got some money to help us develop that program. Mm -hmm. and that was in 2014. Now we're in 2020 and Safe Harbor has really expanded in the state. Yeah. Uh, we have quite a few shelters mm -hmm. and places that are housing victims mm -hmm. and in 2016 we moved youth all the way through 24. That's so big. yeah it was big yeah. I, I was part of testifying at the legislature and there's a lot of people who really worked to get that to that point yeah and um and so we have a system of care we have a director a statewide director mm -hmm. we have navigators throughout the state mm -hmm. and they are housed in the minnesota department of health mm -hmm. And um, the navigators are point people in their region, and they have big regions like we have the West Central, Central Minnesota region that you know has a navigator. Yeah. And that woman who happens to be in that position, she is a point person for 
um, officers or for someone looking for, you know, I have this gal, I don't know where to, what to do, what can you help me? She educates people, so she's speaking all the time to different groups and explaining and helping people understand. And she's supposed to help develop a system of care in her region. Yeah. So she's working with juvenile detention places and different to help them to understand how to work with these youth and to help build a good system of care so no kids fall through the cracks. Absolutely. So that's our system. And um, we have really grown, and we have, besides the navigators, we also have, you know, shelters, but we also have advocates housed in different, like Lutheran Social Services might have a sexually exploited trafficking advocate. Mm -hmm. And all these are grant paid, so through the legislature, yeah. which has continued some pots of money mm -hmm. for the next so many years. Mm -hmm. And so it's really a beautiful system. Mm -hmm. But what I recognize after working and opening the Hearts for Freedom, and then um, seeing that the system is going well is we have very little for women. So it's kind of like you're you're 25 now, so you should know better, and you need to get yourself out of this situation. You know, you shouldn't be doing that. You're an adult. Yeah. Some people think that way. Yeah. Right. Right. But, but the reality is, this person's been trafficked since they were 13. Yeah. No skills. Yeah. Criminal record. Yeah. Drug addiction. Yeah. It just goes on and on, mm -hmm. and they um, can be criminalized they still can even be criminalized after age 18. Mm -hmm. Some communities are really good, their officers understand and they don't criminalize, but there's a lot of women who have all sorts of criminal records because yeah. their trafficker told them, if you don't come back here with this X amount of money, I'm mm -hmm. gonna beat you. So she would steal or she would return things or steal from the buyer or whatever and um, do, and, get, and drugs is a big part of it too. Mm -hmm. So there's often charges for drug type charges too. Sure. So. Um, so recognizing that there really wasn't much for adult women, um, there's an organization um, in St. Paul, Breaking Free, that's mm -hmm. been in existence for many, many years, and mm -hmm. they provide good services to women, but don't yeah. really have the shelter sure. plate piece. Um, and then I knew that I needed to open Care of Prepage, and yeah. that was really a God thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, God really prepared me over the years mm -hmm. and actually really showed me in a special way that this was something coming down the road. Yeah. And um, I knew that there was a great need for adult women, and so that's where Care of Refuge came in. Absolutely. So with that in mind, what are the services, what, what, what services does Care of Refuge offer? Right. Um, Care of Refuge, we do two programs, our shelter and our transition. Mm -hmm. And the difference being shelter is really um, an opportunity for women to come into the program we hope and pray they will stay all the way through to eventually going out on their own, having their own apartment, having a job, mm -hmm. being independent mm -hmm. and making their own decisions. But we know that it is a very steep battle to get to that point mm -hmm. because of just the damage that's been done, the mental health, the um, physical issues, all of the things that have really been, you know, the addiction. Mm -hmm. Off, you know, young people don't necessarily, it's usually when you've been in traffic for that long, you use drugs to cope, or you have a trafficker who put you on the drugs to make you keep coming back. Mm -hmm. And so there's just so many barriers. So a woman coming into shelter doesn't always stay. Mm -hmm. We, you know, we, we are warm and welcoming place. We don't judge them. We really care and nurture. But they struggle sometimes. It's like they have that that um, trauma bond or Stockholm syndrome, mm -hmm. or whatever, to that trafficker sometimes. Um, they're fearful. Mm -hmm. If I don't get back there, he's going to find me, he's going to beat me or kill me. Or, you know, there's all kinds of fears. And yeah. and a big part is they don't feel they're worth it. They're worthwhile. They've been told that this is it. This is all they're good for. They've been used and brutalized and abused for years and years and years. So mm -hmm. they can't even imagine that. By the time you're an adult woman, you can't even imagine you could ever live a different kind of life. How would I ever get a job? I don't have any schooling. I don't know how to fill out an application. Mm -hmm. And if I did fill out an application, what I put on that line that says, what work have you done? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, who, how could I look someone in the eye and interview? Mm -hmm. You know, I just, you know, I'm crap, <laughs> you know? And so they come in and in shelter and sometimes they leave. And then sometimes they come back because mm -hmm. they know we're safe and we're, we're safe and we're, um, they can trust us. We want to build that trust and relationship. Shel transition is once a woman goes through our three phases of shelter, and it's really transition program is when a woman's at a point where she's like, I'm not going back. Mm -hmm. I want to yeah. work. I want to save money. I want to have my own apartment. Mm -hmm. I want. And she's gotten to enough 
of the healing process to be able to see a light at the end of the tunnel and start to dream. Yeah. I can be a nurse or I can do these things. Mm -hmm. And so that's our two programs. But how we do the healing yeah. is a, um, what we call a holistic model. Mm -hmm. Body, mind, soul, and spirit is mm -hmm. how we frame that. Body being, of course, physical safety but also physical wellness. So we have a nurse who works part-time and assesses and makes sure they get any of the care they need in that way. Yeah. And also healthy nutrition and, and exercise and just healthy wellness, what mm -hmm. is that? Uh, mind, uh, we, that would be all of the mental health, the chemical health, the groups that we run, the like coping skills or relation, healthy relationships or um, our trafficking specific group that we give every woman does in shelter which helps them suddenly to open their eyes to the game that was played on them mm -hmm. and so they just start to identify that guy doesn't really love me mm -hmm. and this is what happened mm -hmm. so the mind is these groups um, and also we do some horse therapy because I know the power of horses mm -hmm. and healing and so I want them to get opportunity to do that yeah. and we're about to get our own dog therapy dog. really yep oh that's fun um, and so we're preparing for that right now because we the puppy was born on in August and we're yeah, that's what kind of great Pyrenees. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's amazing. So our board chair raises them. And yeah. We promised once we were permanent, we would get our own puppy. So, that's so, cool. so that, and then um, the other part of, you know, that mind part of the healing, and is a, a critical part for our program is that we have a couple of survivors that actually work in the program, mm -hmm. and so they are having a survivor who's healed, and and to be able to walk alongside them is really powerful because yeah i understand and know about trafficking but i never lived the experience and it's so horrific and degrading and shameful that you most people wouldn't understand and you would be hard to someone who's lived it understands so to have that person walk alongside so that's the mind the soul is um how i describe that is the gifts, talents, interests, and um, skills that a person has, yeah. and what they might want to do with mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And so that really keys in on education mm -hmm. and employment, but yeah. also recreation and leisure. Yeah. You know, maybe you like baking, maybe you like gardening. Yeah. But we want to get the woman into any form of education. Some have taken GED, some have gotten a high school diploma. We have mm -hmm. one gal right now going to St. Paul State. Yeah. And, you um, know, whatever they need, or maybe they want um, to just learn a trade and, mm -hmm. you know, work, you know, that kind of thing. So, Absolutely. and then um, employment readiness is huge. Mm -hmm. We start them as soon as possible in that, where they just start learning just your basic employment skills. Mm -hmm. How do you dress for the job? How do you communicate? You know, all yeah. those kinds of things leading to uh, filling out applications, building a resume, mm -hmm. and eventually getting a job. So that's soul. Yeah. And then spirit is... You know, because we recognize that a woman, for a woman to get out of this life permanently, she needs healing in her whole being. Mm -hmm. And um, if we just did the employment readiness and the soul part and never did the mental health, all the therapy that they need, and the psychiatric, I mentioned sometimes psychiatric medications are needed to help just get them in a calm pace to be able to work. Yeah. Um, they might not, they will, more than likely won't make it unless they get that holistic healing. So in spirit, we are a Christian organization, mm -hmm. but we recognize that not everyone comes to us with that faith or even probably some real tainted ideas about God mm -hmm. because they've had pastors who have abused them or for, you know, all kinds of reasons. Why did God abandon me like this? Why was I, you know, so yeah. how we see that we, we want women to be able to go work and discover who God is to them. We are a Christian organization. And how we, we see that is as staff, we approach women how we see Jesus approach people, mm -hmm. loving them, accepting them right where they're at, not expecting or demanding, mm -hmm. and really not judging, you know, just really accepting them. And we recognize that not every woman, is, you know, we provide opportunities mm -hmm. for women to explore their faith, but also we bring volunteers, we do Bible study, women can go to church, we, you know, different things, but no one, what, what I, what Terrebonne Refuge does not do is require, force, or coerce women to do Christian programs, yeah. because that's what they're coming out of, is force, coercion, and requirement. Sure. And so we just provide opportunity, and we mm -hmm. provide an atmosphere that is very caring and loving, mm -hmm. and, you know, chances to, to meet God, yeah. and um, to build a relationship if they choose to. 
so they can still get involved they can still come in yeah they don't we don't as i said we have that available mm -hmm. and maybe for them as they do go we do goals in those four areas maybe for them they're um, when it comes to the spirit you know it's like maybe it's just getting in tune with nature and just understanding you know yeah. You know, just what they, maybe they want to read a book, maybe they want, you know, mm -hmm. we, we aren't pushing and pressuring or forcing, but we provide opportunity for them to discover. Absolutely. And we're strength-based and we're very trauma-informed, and mm -hmm. that's being trauma-informed is making sure that we aren't creating more trauma. Yeah. Um, and so teaching, you know, how to really be sensitive, not, you know, be a place that is very, um, you know, just aware of trauma. Well, it's been very encouraging just to to see and hear all the things that Terabith Refuge is doing. Mm -hmm. For those who are listening who would be interested in getting involved mm -hmm. with Terabith Refuge specifically, what might that look like? Okay. Um, well, we are funded by donors and grants and, um, yeah, basically donors and grants. And, and we do have support of, of some businesses mm -hmm. and churches. We have some churches that have committed to supporting us. Um, and so we always welcome any kind of financial gifts, mm -hmm. whether that's monthly or whether that's a one-time, you know, that's how we continue to operate. So that's important. Um, other ways that people can be involved is um, with in-kind gifts. Mm -hmm. And in-kind gifts are anything that would help a household to run. So we're talking about paper products, mm -hmm. cleaning supplies, food, um, personal care products for the women, all of those kinds of things we've had people just give to us and yeah. um, and that's very helpful and helps our bottom line. Mm -hmm. uh, volunteers are really important at Terrence Refuge, uh, which kind of you know, <laughs> you're just here, you're, you know, going to be a volunteer and just kind of get yeah. started. Mm -hmm. But people can volunteer in so many different ways. They can, um, you know, teach a skill or, you know, be a mentor or um, help in our office with doing mailings mm -hmm. or drive women to appointments. Um, you know, even we like we are getting this dog, yeah. and we have someone who was helping us get a, a kennel area and stairs up to the deck. So you oh, know, yeah. set. So uh, there was a guy doing that, and someone who was doing has done some mowing for us, mm -hmm. and you know, all those kinds of things. So volunteering is just an endless way that people can volunteer, and that's very helpful. Um, but I also let people know that it's so important to educate yourself and to be able to educate your family and friends mm -hmm. about this issue so that they can be aware, can be protective of young people in their lives, and also just make people know, let people know that this is a problem and that it really needs attention and needs to be stopped. We want to end this. And the only way we can end it is if people understand the gravity of it and what's going on in their community and take some action. You know, it can be a small step or just letting others know what's going on.